So friends, it is, I'm so excited about this. I mean, I've been excited about every part of, of our two days here, but I am especially excited about this next part. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce our final Daughterhood San Diego fifth anniversary speaker. Everyone that's taken part in, the, in this event, they all know her by name, but let me, I, I, I'm gonna take some additional time just to tell you more about Ann Tomlinson and her very impressive bio, just beyond being you know, the founder of daughterhood.org and this national movement of daughterhood circles, which are now all over the country and connecting us, all of us as caregivers with each other for support and, for, and information. I, I'm gonna take a kind of like a deep dive into her career and her bio because I, it's important that we all understand just how much work she's doing to, you know, better, to better our aging experience, not just for all of us as caregivers and for our parents, but really just as a society, what she's doing for our country right now. So I'm gonna spend some time and, um, and I'm gonna embarrass you a little bit. I hope you blush because I wanna break it down. Um, so Anne leads our nation in setting the direction of aging and disability policy. She's the founder of ATI Advisory, which is a research and advisory services firm, which is based out of Washington, DC, where she lives. And um, what they do is they work to reform health and long-term care delivery and financing, how, how we pay for it, right? Because we, that's, that's, that's the question all of us face is how are we going to face, you know, how are we going to pay for this caring of our parents um, and for ourselves when we age? But she does that, you know, she answers those questions for our country's frail and vulnerable older adults. And the research of the work that she does is so important and influential that she has testified before the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and she's testified before the Senate Aging Committee, she's appeared before the Congressional Long-Term Care Commission, and the Bipartisan Policy Center. So, um, you know, the, our government's leaders are, she is advising our government's leaders on aging policy. and. Outside of that, she's also advising private industries and senior and long-term care organizations, partnering with them, with payer, provider, and financial leaders on how they can strategically develop and grow opportunities for their own companies. So any online or media publication that involves healthcare or aging, she's written for them, she's been featured in them, and that includes publications like uh, contributing to Health Affairs, Huffington Post, McKnight's Long-Term Care News, Aging Media Network. I mean, she's been on all of them. So she serves on the Medicaid Advisory Panel for Aetna. She's also on the Board of Directors for Caregiving Action Network. She's a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. And in 2018, Next Avenue named her as an influencer in aging. And Early on in her career, she got her start working in government, first as a healthcare advisor to Congressman John Lewis of Georgia, the great John Lewis who recently passed, and then also as the head for Medicaid program oversight at the Office of Management and Budget. So in 2000, in, sorry, excuse me, in the year 2000, she joined Avalair Health, leading the firm's provider practice and developing business intelligence products for 14 years. So even though we know Anne as being, the, as being completely down to earth, completely approachable, just one of the girls, again, I just, I wanted to make it a point to take the time to really emphasize her bio and emphasize her career because I want you, you know, it's important that we all hear and that we all comprehend, comprehend how much work she has, she has done and how much work she continues to do to make sure that we as Americans, that we age well, um, you know, that our parents are going to age well, that we're going to age well when we get to that point. So I know that we still have a long way to go, but she is a strong, strong, strong advocate for us as caregivers and also for seniors. And she continues to put in that work to benefit our society as we age. So I cannot wait to hear this presentation from Anne. And um, so with pleasure, I'm going to introduce you to, to Anne Tumblinson and, and I'm, I'm going to let you take it away. Wow. Thank you. You, I, that is the best sort of delivery of that bio I have ever heard. <laughs> you guys, it's a, it's, imp it's so impressive that I'm like, I want to do wow. this because, uh, you know, and you're kind of a big deal and we just, we're excited to hear from you. Thank you. Golly, thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, I really appreciate that. And, um, this event, holy smokes, you guys, like, 
I'm just, I mean, I'm just blown away, blown away the level of professionalism and just what you put into this to make this happen. It's just, you know, I was puttering around my kitchen tonight, you know, getting my wine and everything. And I was like, I mean, this doesn't, daughterhood really does not, it feels like it is owned by all of us. Like this is the level of sort of, sort of co-ownership that we have. And I see we have Roseanne on tonight, who is our podcaster. And we've got Susan, who's been, I, I will start crying if I start talking about Susan, because she's been with us from the, with me from the very beginning, like when this was, I'll talk about this, but from when it was a, just a little seed. So it just, uh, the, the, the level of, I couldn't ask for better colleagues and coworkers in, in this and encouragers and reassurers and everything that uh, Karen and Christine, you guys have done to make this not just, you know, San Diego, but the whole country and the mentorship that you give to all of the leaders. I just, in this circle, all of you guys, ah, you San Diego people are my favorite people. <laughs> you're the best oh i just love this circle so um i i just I'm, I'm really glad to be here so i just i gotta tell you all and some of you know this story but you know uh you know i had a job uh, that, that christine was talking about the last job i had it kind of i had a corporate job and i i i mean i was working on aging and long-term care but um and in a in a big company and um in 2014, I just, I quit it because I didn't feel like I was really, I, I didn't feel like it gave me the opportunity to make the kind of difference that I wanted to make, but I didn't really know what that was going to look like. I just knew that I wasn't, I, I knew it wasn't uh, going in the direction that I really felt called to go in. And so, um, so 2014 passed, I figured out a way to pay my bills um, with a little bit of extra work on the side and I just researched what it was like, you know, I just talked to so many family caregivers, my own family, um, friends, people that were starting to go through it. I, I, I talked to so many people and um, I was like, what are we going to do about this is kind of where it's all happening. You know, all of us experts kind of operate up at this level, thinking about all these different programs and how they work and what we should do to change them. But really, when I started talking to family caregivers, that's really really learned what was going on. And so on January 5th of 2015, I wrote for the very first time about this concept that in that moment that I wrote that very first sentence of the very first blog, in the very beginning of 2015, I wrote the word daughterhood. It just came to me. Like it was literally a gift. It just, it just was like right into my head. This is what it's called. Um, and, uh, and I said three things about it that I had learned from all these conversations I'd had in 2014, like caregiving is invisible, you know, all of these people playing these critically important roles, very, very invisible behind the scenes. It is overwhelming. Talked about this already, Jan, everything that you said is just a kind of perfect lead in for, for this. Um, you know, the, the complexity of what we have to deal with, the amount of work that has to be done. It just is too much. It's too much. <laughs> and then finally, it's heartbreaking, right? Because you're uh, for, there's no preparation for that shifting role and, and the decisions that you have to make and the things that you have to do and the dignity that is lost and all of the, all of that, all of that stuff. And so I posted this on LinkedIn. This was my, my first thing I ever wrote. There was no website. Um, and the response was like, oh my God. It was like I had said something that, that really nobody had said out loud. And, um, and I was like, and, and really the response was like, how did you know how I was feeling? I think that might be one of the first things that Christine and, and Karen said to me, or Karen might have said, like, how did you, how did you know? Um, and so what happened at that point is that I became a we, <laughs> um, and Susan Rowe and, um, a couple of other wonderful people, um, that, that I have been talking to about all of this sort of pitched in and we put together a website, put together, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing, <laughs> but we, I shouldn't say Susan knew what she was doing. I didn't know what I was doing, but, um, 
you know, I, and I, we just built this little website and I, and, and, and basically what they said to me, my, my little team was, you just have to keep writing. You just have to keep going. And so I wrote about the feeling of failure, how hard it is to make decisions you know, as Jan talked about this, with so much is at stake, um, how no amount of effort ever feels like it's enough. You can do so much and still feel like you're failing. You're dealing with a broken system and it's about the system, but it really is you. You feel like it's about you. Um, and you have to give yourself, you know, permission just to kind of go from one day to the next. And we put that up on the website. And then it was like, well, okay, first of all, we set up a newsletter and, and my mom signed up <laughs> and my aunt signed up and my sister signed up and like, I had like five people. Uh, and then Susan, I think might was like, let's start a Facebook page. And uh, so then more people signed up and you know how this goes like little by little, it was never viral. Caregiving stuff doesn't go viral. <laughs> And, uh, you know, uh, one day though, I looked up and we had a thousand people signed up, a thousand people. And really, I mean, this is just like, nobody knows really, I mean, nobody really knows who I am and nobody really knows much or cares that much about Carrie. We had a thousand people. We didn't have any, we weren't, you know, just organic. Right. So, you know, then you know, I said like, all right, all right, I, th we're on to something here. I started writing about Medicare and Medicaid. Now, these are my areas of expertise. So I got, you know, I got into it. You know, here's what you need to know. And it was probably a little wonky because I'm not really a writer for, I just, you know, I just did the best I could. <laughs> but, you know, then more people signed up and we had several thousand people within, you know, a handful of months signed up to get information. And then that was, we made it to the kind of like the spring and the the spring time and something really magical happened, which is that um, this is 2015, Karen and Christine got in touch. And, um, you know, they were thinking about all these invisible warriors in their community, taking care of family members who really didn't have anywhere to go uh, or an outlet to talk about what's happening. Um, they liked, I think they liked what I was saying, you know, and they thought, wow, maybe there's some synergy here like this, you know, we want to help people in our community, but we want to do it differently. We don't want it to feel like a support group. We want it to feel like kind of a, what do we want it to feel like? A, a movement. We want this to feel like a movement. And so that's what happened was it was kind of with it, the, the, what, the energy that, that was produced by Karen and Christine, Susan and me coming together and uh, and talking about creating this community um, at, in the San Diego area, but then all all over the country, um, you know, that's what daughterhood is. It's a community of people with shared experience who are providing care to family members, but really, it's a movement. Um, and I say that because, um, you know, when we after we launched the San Diego Circle and we started writing about community and daughterhood and feeling less alone and what, what the beautiful 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 thing that Jan said that just touched my heart and will I will live I will eat lunch on that for <laughs> that will be my nourishment for a long time um, which is this that you felt I wrote it down you you felt a sense of belonging um, that's that that must be I what somehow we conveyed out to the larger world which was um, that um, that because we noticed that people responded with a feeling of being moved. You know, this was like we got this response. People are like, I want to be part of this. And not everybody who got in touch was really ready to be a circle leader. And, you know, there aren't that many Karen and Christine's out there. But but the fact is that they felt moved to get in touch with us. And um, and we really set up what I what I really feel to be is a ministry. And Susan is really the leader of that ministry. And she literally talks to every single person who reaches out to us to start a circle, which has been probably 200 people. Um, we now have um, about, um, I wrote this down, 
many, it's always hard to keep track, but um, about 24 circles operating in about 16 states and Canada. And, you know, there are a lot of people who really reach out because they just want to talk. And Susan listens and she talks and she's so incredibly, again, gifted at that. Um, so, uh, so the, here's the other, this is, this, so, so we have this movement, people are moved, they get in touch with us. There's something about this that grabs them. And we, and of all of those 200 people, there are, and they're definitely a group of incredibly talented and amazing people in there who do devote time and energy to starting circles and leading and serving their communities. And so what started as this, you know, flagship initial experiment and pilot in San Diego becomes a national, a national movement. And the way we know it's really grassroots is that it has its own momentum. So we have no funding. We have no funding. Like we don't have a foundation. We don't have corporate sponsorship. Um, occasionally, you know, I mean, what, everything that's done here, Karen and Christine have paid for, I, I pay for occasionally to boost, you know, uh, a post on Facebook, but we don't advertise. We don't have search engine optimization. You know, there's no revenue model. <laughs> like this is just us. It's just us. Um, it's really just you responding to the moment um, that we're all collectively in and, and really just, I think, desperate to make meaning out of it. So there's this momentum to the movement. And I looked up today, I was thinking about momentum. Uh, because I would say at the very early days of, of daughterhood, I worked so hard on it. I spent hours and hours and hours writing blogs and working on circles and wringing my hands and feeling like I wanted to be bigger and faster and more and more. And, you know, at a certain point I let go and uh, I just let it roll along on its own. And uh, the word momentum means a force gained by movement. So daughterhood San Diego you picked up this tiny little piece of snow you know you rolled it into a little ball and you you, you sent it down the mountain <laughs> and now here we are and we have this nice big movement of snow <laughs> um, and now we've launched a, you know with the pandemic we've everything's gone virtual and that's had its own gifts and in real real value um, so this movement is about meeting our collective need for coming together, sharing information, reassuring each other that everything that you all experience, I don't have to tell you what Daughterhood is about. You, you are living it and you are it. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about um, what, a move, what does a movement do other than support the people in it? Um, I think we all have this experience of this, that there's something really fundamentally wrong and missing in our society about how we go through these last phases of our lives and how our families go through them and that something has to change. It just, it's not sustainable. And um, for a movement to have momentum, the participants need to have, I, I say like a passion, a shared passion, but also a shared set of experiences. And I wanna just, you know, this part of what I want to do is reflect on the last five years and I wanna talk about where we're going, but. I was one of the things that I, I just want to share with you all that I that I, that has been so profound for me um, in doing this work uh, with the daughterhood circle leaders with the circles and then also just with all of the incoming emails and notes and shared messages that we get through various media is that um, this is a there are there is a really incredibly common set of experiences that do not seem to be um, at all, they, they're, they're shared across socio-demographics, political orientation, geography, political orient, I said political orientation, <laughs> yeah, I just saw my mind, um, um, you know, race and ethnicity. And, and, and I just want to share with you that, that sort of body of experiences for just, just almost in a meditative way right now, which is, um, here's what what we know we all worry like every like this is me saying to you that this is literally the theme 
of every interaction that Susan and I have had with every caregiver and every circle leader that over the last five years, we all worry about making the right decisions. We all struggle to manage these ancient, primal and fraught family relationships. Siblings, ah, oh. we all struggle to balance, you know, our loved one's desire for independence with our concerns for their safety. One of the first conversations I had about this was at the very first ever five years ago San Diego meeting. What do you do when your mom won't get off the won't get off the ladder. <laughs> ah, we all feel at some point completely overwhelmed by the situation that we're in and what it demands of it. We all feel like nothing we do is enough and that we're failing. We all experience so much frustration trying to navigate all these bureaucracies. We all wonder, where do I start? What do I do when we're starting? Uh, we all worry about money, um, money, money, money. Do we, are we gonna have enough? Are our parents gonna have enough? What if, who's gonna get it? How much is gonna be left? Who's gonna spend it and how? Ugh, money, oof. We all wanna take better care of ourselves, but we don't know how, and then we feel guilty because we're not doing a good enough job at it. And then what does that mean? What does that mean, all this stress on us? What is that gonna mean for us when we're old? We can all recite the Medicare alphabet, parts A, B, C, and D. <laughs> we all miss our friends. Jan talked about that. We all worry about how caregiving is affecting our kids our work or our marriage. Uh, we all feel guilty all the time, all the time. We really want to be able to say no without feeling guilty, but we can't. And we struggle to set priorities and stick to them and then we can't. And we all want to quit. We don't have enough help. We hate, hate, hate having to figure out home care and assisted living and nursing homes and that working with them and dementia. That's all I can say, dementia, oh my God. So most of all, and very paradoxically, we're all united in our feeling. How paradoxical is this? We all feel all alone. Um, we were really fortunate to have a Washington Post reporter named Jessica Rabbits um, write an article about daughterhood for the Washington Post. Um, and when I pulled out a quote from that, I wanted to just share with you. She said, while new mothers are showered with love and often share a path well lit, by friends and neighbors. The road is often dark and hard to navigate when it comes to time to mother their own mothers or any relative for that matter. And so why is the road so dark? Well, first of all, so I wanna talk a little about why the road is so dark and what we can do about it because it is a new road. <laughs> That's a big part of the reason. It's a really new road. Um, this country and the rest of the developed world have experienced really, I mean, I just cannot emphasize enough how unprecedented the increase in lifespan has been since the 1960s. So we've gone from dying in our mid to late 60s to dying in our late 70s. That is a longevity increase of over 10 years. That's a lot. That's a lot. And so and many, many, many people are now living into their 80s and 90s. And so what we have not done is increase our health span at the at same rate. So if we're gaining lifespan of 10 years, we're gaining a health span of about three to five years. What that means, and these are averages. So what that means is that there are a lot of people living into their 80s and 90s and having, you know, five to 10 years of what we call late life morbidity which just means uh, you know, the need for help with somebody else and managing all of the daily aspects of their lives. So we're now at a point as a society where every single person who is turning 65 tomorrow has a 50-50 chance of at some point before they die needing somebody else's help with basic activities of daily living. And about a 15% chance of being in that situation for five or more years. So um, this is, this, this is like a, a new phenomenon. And so what that means is that we don't, our new road, this new road that we're traveling down isn't well paved. It doesn't have any light. You know, we're all, and we're all just kind of driving in our little cars all by ourselves. Um, because we haven't created 
any kind of a system, right? There's no actual system. So I feel like it's been a lot of time thinking to myself, what is a system? We use that word all the time, and especially with COVID, right? Systems are breaking down, da da da. You know, we have a criminal justice system, we have an educational system, we have you know a healthcare system. It's not great. Postal system. You know, we have all of these, and really, um, uh, I, I think of systems as like it's it's when we finally realize that it is not reasonable or efficient anymore for us to create everything from scratch by ourselves. <laughs> that that we have to join in some kind of a shared. Um, a shared set of responsibilities for kind of each other in society. And that, um, and this is like, this isn't even socialistic in any way, shape or form, because the fact of the matter is when you have core systems, then the private sector can, it's like a scaffolding, then the private sector can hang all kinds of things on it and make money. And we have an economy, but without, I can't, like, I can't tell you how many small little aging tech startups get in touch with me. I, I, I wish I had a dollar for every single person who's called me because of an app that they invented, you know, to help people manage their parents' care. And I always say to them, you know, no one's going to use this or buy it <laughs> because you can't reach these people. They don't have any money to pay for anything. There's no, there's no scaffolding. Like this is just it's just, you're going to reach out to every single individual family in America, one at a time. <laughs> like that's the situation that we're in. Um, so think of all of the things that change when you get to that stage of your life. Like think of all of the need. You go from living one way to living a totally different way. Housing, nutrition, food, transportation, socialization, used to get up every morning and go every Sunday morning and go to church. You know, you, you made your food this way, you lived in this house, and now all of that is disrupted and has to shift for some period of time before you die. If you live long enough and you lose functioning or cognition, every single one of these is affected. Um, and unfortunately, because we haven't normalized any of these changes in our society, what happens is that there is literally nothing to kind of move these folks and their families through, uh, you know, a system that we all share. And so we are lucky because we have people like Karen and Christine who make, who go through this themselves or their families go through it and they, and they create, you know, um, uh, like little mini systems, <laughs> like little mini systems where they're, they're out there helping, you know, um, as many people as they possibly can navigate all of this. But that's, that's you know, we don't have enough uh, Karens and Christines to go around. It, it, that, that's not a sustainable way as a society to, to set it up so that we can all be served. So, um, you know, so basically what's happening is that literally every single family in the whole country is, is creating from scratch practically their own aging system. And that's super inefficient. It's inequitable. Um, and it's not sustainable. So, so, you know, um, we're, we're at a juncture. We are really, truly, truly, I mean, I've been working on long-term care and aging issues for almost 30 years. And I mean, I feel like since I started, people are like, this is a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> the baby boomers are coming. Ah, we're gonna, you know, and I'm like, is it really a crisis? Because nobody seems really all that worried about it. So here's one of the silver linings of COVID, right? Which is that um, it has exposed, right? Like never before the absence of such a system. It's the nursing home, for example, world, which has never gotten very much attention and nobody has really paid. And now it's like every day, I, I was like two hours before I came here to talk to you, I was reading up on the latest release from the federal government about nursing homes because it is, they're coming out daily now, you know, trying to, trying to somehow get a toehold on what's going on and, and fix it and make it better. But we literally just got a release from the federal government. They are now uh, uh, changing the regulations for nursing homes to require that they allow family members to come visit um, with 
with under a certain set of conditions and rules and to do with what this community spread is in that area where the nursing home is located. But this is just to say that the, 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 the very high levels of the Department of Health and Human Services within the federal government are now paying attention to nursing homes in a way like they used to pay attention to pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> you know, and uh, in big hospital systems that have lots of money. Now they're focused on nursing homes. I sat in a meeting with, um, as I'm a volunteer for the Biden campaign, and I sat in a meeting where I heard, you know, high level people say, the most important issue now is long-term care. The most important issue is aging. How, are, how can we create community-based systems that will support families um, as they go through this process? And how can we pay for the services that they need? You know, these are questions we've been asking ourselves a really long time, but but now uh, there are a lot of people. So I'll just say that this is just, you know, there are a lot of people who who made their careers working on health insurance reform, you know, pharmaceutical drug coverage. They're fancy Harvard economists and MIT economists, you know, uh, and now they want to work. This is what they're working on. So, I, uh, you know. I, I, I feel, I do feel like, I mean, we have a presidential candidate who is using, who used the little bit of airtime that he has uh, to talk about actual substantive issues, which isn't much right now, to talk about building a caring economy, an economy that actually values caregiving, both paid and unpaid, and actually devoting and dedicating resources to investing in building a better, you know, aging system for us for the future. So I remain, um, you know, I remain really helpful, hopeful. Um, and, um, you know, this is, this is a historic opportunity um, because people in Washington are talking about it in a way that they never have before. Um, I just want to quickly share my screen if I can figure, I'm always, hold on, one, give me a moment while I, Susan's probably dying right now because I'm actually trying to do something technical. <laughs> She's like, what's happening? Can you guys see that? Yep. <gasps> what? <laughs> Yay. I have a few slides that I wanted to share um, because just to kind of wrap everything up, I, I, I started at the, at the, about, so I, you know, I talked about what daughterhood was and what it has become. Um, I talked about it, it's a movement for change that um, it's, whose time has come, right? We are sitting here at this juncture of history uh, when the political forces and the social forces and the healthcare forces are all coming together, I think, to really drive change. Um, we have this community of people that are, are, you know, already clearly moved to be in community with each other and to do something different to see to see the suffering of the next generation of caregivers be less than what they experienced um and uh i want to start with hold on a second i'm just gonna let me uh what the what did that do oh well, nope that's not it <laughs> second view uh, one second nope okay we'll just stay here <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, so we, so here we are at this moment. Um, this, this quote by Ross Chast, who is an incredible, incredible author. If you don't have the book, can't we talk about something more pleasant? And please go get it because it is the most beautiful, beautiful graphic sort of memoir that I've ever seen. And she wrote this quote. This was a country I didn't even know existed, which I just thought really encapsulates the experience. It's like, what yeah. is this? <laughs> so, um, but we all have this reaction. 
And um, if we are all having this reaction, then I think we can all come together to, to create some change. I, I wanted to also share with you, here's another funny thing about daughterhood. So Susan and I talked to a couple of different people, I would say women within the like within two or three months of each other who um, who literally said one was in like Minnesota and one was in like Texas. And these women said to us, I mean, almost verbatim, these, these two statements, um, you know, this is the most meaningful thing I've ever done, but sometimes I just go out to the backyard by myself and scream. We need to give everybody a damn it doll, right? <laughs> That's what we need to do. Um, okay, oops, hang on. All right, so, um, that wasn't all of this. <laughs> um, bear with me for a minute. Oh, okay. I've lost you guys. Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, one second. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Um, Susan's dying right now. She's like, why didn't you just let me drive the slides? Um, so, you know, we have um, over many, many years, over the last five years, put together quite a few of these kinds of what we call inspirational Facebook posts. And the ones that have been the most popular, I just wanted to share with you for a moment. And then, and then you know, kind of issue a call to action. And then I know everybody's tired and we want to wrap up, but um, we really, this, this really cannot be a solo event. You know, taking care of a loved one is not a solo event. It has to be a team event. So we have to start looking at everything through a different lens. And, you know, and I've heard Karen refer to daughterhood as the brain trust. And um, I think this, this quote really kind of encapsulates that, you know, who can help me get this done? Who can help me? You know, there's no such thing as a CEO who runs her company alone. You are a CEO, essentially, of a system, of a whole health and aging services system for an individual. You can't do that by yourself. Um, and you can't try to take it all on at once. So this quote really resonated with people. Just take the first step. You know, this is very trite. I mean, we've heard this a million times. Don't, you don't look up at the mountain. You look down at the path, right? What's just the next right step that you have to take? Just shine your flashlight right, right where you're going next. And that's where all of the answers will be. And if one path doesn't work, you go down to another. So um, I want to, you know, this is, this is, this is, you know, I don't want to get too woo woo here, but um, I would just say that, that what's exciting to me about the fact that we have a presidential candidate um, talking about these issues is that it almost feels to me like our ability to respond to this moment and shift our whole orientation to, to caring for each other is actually going to be the thing that's going to, to kind of, you know, heal and repair a lot of the brokenness of, of our society. We, we have to like lurch in the direction of valuing, caring, you know, over conflict. And that, and that is, that's a big shift, but I, I think that almost that the caregivers are almost the ones who have to lead us in that direction. That's what, that's what we do. So, you know, in all of our spare time, <laughs> all these social movements. Um, so, you know, in terms of the future of daughterhood, I, I would like to say I have a grand plan and I'm marshalling all of these soldiers and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna march on, on Congress when we can. Um, I think maybe that is what we will do. Um, but I, I, what I can promise you, you're in? Yeah. No, I mean, I wrote that in the chat. Like that is, that is <laughs> what I want next for us. Like, and obviously daughterhood is, is, is your, it's your, I mean, it's you, right? Um, and, but I mean, honestly, that is what I want for us. I wrote in the chat that we are, we're 65 million deep. I mean, that is a big, big voice. Mm -hmm. And if we 
use that voice and then we like there's no there's no choice for the country there's no choice for the leaders of the country for the politicians they need to listen so i mean i would really i mean i'm in for mobilizing and um using you know and if daughterhood's going to do it i would love that to force like to honestly to seriously affect change and like You've already said this is a movement. Keep going with that movement and seriously affect change, change policy. Yeah, I'm in for that. I mean, I don't know if it's, it's a big road. I don't really know how to get there, but it's something. It's something. It's so. something, yes. And I think what I struggle with a little bit sometimes is like, there's so many people who are suffering individually. And we, we all of us collectively spend a lot of time you know, ministering to that, which is important. Um, and I kind of love in some ways that it's not scaled, you know, we're not like yeah, trying yeah. to touch like, you know, we're just, it's one person at a time. It's yeah. one conversation at a time. And I love that about it. But at the same time, I, I'm feeling more and more like, you know, we're in a really different place than we were five years ago, as far as the country is concerned. Um, and so this is this is kind of our moment and uh, yeah i mean i kind of feel like it's been we've had the past five years to kind of to kind of test it and see like how how this has grown and like you said i think it's it's time you know 65 million that's a big that's a big vote it's a lot of people they'll have to listen yeah and even i don't think it really matters even you know whether you're a republican or a democrat or anything at, at this point anybody that talks about it if you know, anybody has caregiving on their agenda i'm listening you know it doesn't matter if they agree really like i want to hear what they have to say right right well, i want to i just want to pause here and just open it up i mean it, we're i know we're close to time and i think um people are probably, I know if, if Roseanne and Susan and all the people on the East Coast are like, you know, but, um, and I'm sure the West Coast folks are, are Zoom fatigued as well, so. So I, you know, I just kind of want to open that up. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions about what we've talked about? Any questions specific for Anne? let me know let us know like unmute yourself and <laughs> let's talk let's talk about it i do hey. thank you and you're awesome thank you so much um i have so many thoughts christine i am so down to march <laughs> you know um i have a lot of thoughts that i'll try to quickly encapsulate um so I attended yesterday's and I had to leave early to go to one of my multiple anti-racist activities, but it's a once a week meeting. I promise this is connected. And so we all kind of, it, we talk about lots of things, but one of the things we do is kind of talk about things that actions that we took that week. And everybody always says, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. Which, <laughs> hello, daughterhood. Yeah. And over the course of months of attending this group, that group and, and knowing about daughterhood, I had this realization that that's sort of the, the way all of the systems are set up right now is because we do not have faith in the community. Mm. Every person oh. feels like I'm not doing enough because they don't have faith that everyone's pitching in and it, it just like beamed on my head that it's just like a barn raising like no one at a barn raising says oh i didn't do enough they all knew their task or the level of their contribution um and they could count on each other to make sure the barn gets raised and i can't imagine that anyone ever in a barn raising thought oh i'm not doing enough but i <laughs> strong realization across all of these systems and everything that's going through an upheaval right now is that we all need to turn back to the value of community and away from the value of i have to do everything myself and self-reliance which is you know very much the whole capitalistic i won't go on and on but it's just i'm sure y'all felt all of the connections through everything that's been unveiled through covid so I remember last time Ann, you came to San Diego and we, you know, 
there was a little bit of a conversation about how activist or political this yep. is going to be, you know, not, not to sacrifice any of the, you know, empathy, camaraderie, and resources, but to really kind of, anyway. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> That's yeah. my thought. <laughs> I, no, 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 no. I absolutely love love what you said. I love it. It's, I wrote it down. I wrote faith and community in quotes and barn raising and just, um, you know, it, we've done, we've experimented with some national daughterhood circle kinds of meetings and, um, you know, a lot, you know, I, we, I think one of the things that we could do uh, we've been talking about like what to do next with that. We could have a national conversation. We could host a national conversation about about policy. You know, my I wonder how many people would come. But uh, you know, it's hard to mobilize caregivers because they're tired. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna have a hard time bringing Roseanne out of her house. Although I think she's pretty active all by herself. I could talk. <laughs> I just can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. I have a comment, if it's okay. Yes. Yes. Well, I, so I'm a doctor, and I work in long-term care full time. One of my good friends from high school is an Italian. And um, he told me once when we were talking about this that uh, he's afraid of getting old in, in the United States because our culture is so different than theirs back in Europe. He, he, there's 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 a, a loss of the sense of family and 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 uh, closeness. Um, and he he regretted the idea of you know looking at a place to go uh, so far. I mean, literally so far from family. Um, and then the other thing that comes to mind is that. I live in the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina, oh. and um, and I'm from I'm from Texas. I was you know so I'm kind of a transplant, and uh, there is a culture of of independence and autonomy. You know, don't 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 uh, don't tell me what to do kind of mentality. And in nursing homes, of course, I run against that a lot in in uh, patients and their families. Um, so, but I also have met families who have been transplanted also and learned how different their little kind of culture of their of their part of the country is and so i think a, a national conversation is is valuable it's probably the most important thing we can do but um we would be gathering at a national table from such different backgrounds you know the the the, the northern europeans in the midwest and the you know the uh, whatever you know the the English here in the in the South and, and this this disparate kind of cult, which which is what makes our country great, but it makes it hard for us to come together in a social issue like this that 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 transcends boundaries and identity. Um, it, it occurs to me that uh, as, as a film major um, and as an English major in college, that it's culture that will permeate these things, the culture of individuals and the in a sense of a culture of family as a country, which is what which is what daughterhood seems to be, um, but but we need someone who, uh, you know, someone an entity or someone who um, who can generate that kind of interest from a media standpoint, mm. like a like a Mike Rowe with dirty jobs or or somebody like that who's traveling and um, and and exploring aspects. And I thought about doing that. Myself, not not as a TV personality, but as a, you know, a, a student, um, taking a sabbatical and going across the country and exploring what nursing homes are like, and 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 looking into this specifically, and then opening a, a national conversation of look, some of you are going to be in these nursing homes, and I, I can't change it all, so uh, I can't change it in our generation, but maybe if we have a discussion, you can help me, come up with ideas, and then I can disseminate those to make these nursing homes better for us. So I'm just kind of thinking along those lines, you know, and I love um, that. Yeah. Anyway, so I just want to kind of throw that out there. That's no, I don't I, I'm not trying to make light of that at all, but that's kind of my dream job <laughs> to just almost anthropologically, but with 
with the, with with the ability to kind of document you know the findings in a, in real time with somebody who's a good storyteller to be able to just kind of lay it out um uh, that's a beautiful idea that is a it's, beautiful it's, idea it's, it's 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 the it's that it's that kind of um exposition if you will uh you know it's kind of like when we travel we americans travel to europe um and if you spend enough time in another country or south america for that matter my family's from south america if you spend enough time there then you you the the differences start to fall away you know the jokes become common um the troubles become common uh the potholes might get bigger in some countries but they're still potholes um <laughs> you know what i mean so uh, so I think the same thing could happen in our country in, um, I mean, what better way to be aware of the, of our, of our worldly community than to be in other countries. So what better way to uh, come together as a country, as caregivers, than to share those stories and our commonalities, but highlighting the differences in them so that they don't become barriers. I think that's a big challenge. I'm so glad you said that, Charlie, and I so appreciate you being on the call. And you're in North Carolina? Where in North Carolina are you? I'm in Franklin. It's about an hour, 15 minutes west of Asheville. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you are in the Appalachian Mountains. I, I went to college nearby, and I I love that area. And I my family's from East Tennessee, so mm -hmm. we, we always joke about that sort of Scotch-Irish yeah. Independence, like yeah. keep it in the family. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, you know that that um, the storytelling that leads in highlighting the differences. I mean, I could see that as a documentary, right? In 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 care and how care is delivered. So, for example, I mean, we see it. Karen and I are in senior care, so we we see the difference in. For example, in having resources and not having resources, so you can you can you know the difference in the care that you receive when um, there are people, there are individuals. I mean, and you're you're dealing with how you pay for aging, right? So how do you pay for care? So when when Karen and I are dealing with our clients, home care, which will private one on one, which will which will essentially cost a family, an individual, about twenty thousand dollars a month to get home care at home. That's crazy, $20,000 a month. That's, and that's what it costs right now, roughly. So compare that to somebody that can afford that as opposed to somebody that is on, that's in poverty on Medicaid. Like, what does that look like? You know, being able to film that in a home. Yep. You know, Ricky would yep. happily do that with you, Anne, by the way, I'm telling you right now, like that would be his dream project. But um, <laughs> so if you ever did want to do that, he would do that with you. But I mean, that's, <laughs> that is moving. That's moving, yep. right? So the type of care that, that is delivered with somebody on Medicaid versus somebody that is kind of has the platinum health plan, plan versus, you know, with getting one-on-one -on -one care at home, huge difference. And it would be very, um, that's a big story. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Roseanne, I see you with your hand up. Do you think there's a way to open it up and have people send their stories in and start that way? Do you know what I mean? Everybody, just write it down. Everybody has a story. People want to share it. And as a beginning of, um, to see what direction, but because you'll get, you'll get a thousand stories easily. I don't know. Yeah, we, we've I mean, talked about doing that. I think Susan and I've talked about doing that several times. Um, like stories from care, especially when I've had to, the one time I had to testify, I really wanted to have, kind of wanted mm -hmm. to go with like, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah. yeah, yeah, no, we could definitely do that. Um, Aaron, you were going to, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I was on a, a hospice um, call today at a home, a house call. And this was a 94 year old uh, woman who's at her own home and hospice comes. And of course she has a, a village of kids and grandkids and neighbors who are there in addition to what 
hospice is providing and um, I can't remember who else is providing, but in, in this storytelling, I would love to see, you know, the solution speak of there are resources out there that are hidden that people don't know about what hospice provides or what Medicare provides or what the VA benefit provides. And this family figured it out and that family didn't figure it out. Um, I know another 98 year old woman, she has around the clock healthcare that she's reimbursed for. And I haven't quite figured out how wow. Was that private practice was that Medicare was that a certain diagnosis. Um, there are resources out there that families are tapping into and, and next door and, and you know, uh, what Chris, Christine's, you know, legitimate services, legal services, but there's also family services and neighbor services and just neighborly barn building services. And how do you ask for it? And um, if we think about Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal and his PBS special, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He talked about the country he's from, India, and then other countries that are multi-generational households and what they do with aging process and end of life care versus what we do is, oh, keep mom safe, stick her in a facility where she'll have no fun and she'll get depressed, but by golly, she's safe. Right. So like, how do we highlight it that it isn't all about safety and it isn't all about longevity? Right. How do we keep them home as long as possible? And how do we tap into the Medicaid, Medi-Cal, VA, neighbors, children, grandchildren, mm -hmm. how do you barter? Like what is the resource um, list, PDF, links, mm -hmm. that it's, mm -hmm. it's, the story becomes the telling of, and you can do this too. Mm -hmm. You don't have mm -hmm. to end up $20,000 a month, but you will if you, if, if you give if it. You don't know it. I mean, it'll certainly march down that direction because we monetize everything in this country. Everything becomes a business. Everything is, a, you know, corporate everything. Um, everything. Everything's a corporatocracy. But, but what about barn building? What about death building? What about end of life? What about, right. you know, there, there are resources out there and how do we crack that code for people? Right, right. You know, mm -hmm. can I add one more thing? And, I, and this is something that, and Aaron, you know, everything you said is so right. And I want to, I want to emphasize, this is something that, that we talked about at our last Zoom meeting for Daughterhood Circle leaders is, you know, Anne pointed out the fact that, uh, you know, part of the reason, well, I think that part of the reason why this isn't part of the national conversation really with, with uh, politicians and in our government is because of how expensive it is. And because the recognition of the fact that the cost of caregiving, you know, and Anne said that she was like, the cost of caregiving and long-term care is really built on the backs of caregivers. The caregivers are paying for it. And they're, they're paying for it because they're not paid, you know? So we are the ones paying for long-term care, right? Our government is. So in, if, or if, if as a government, as a country, if we're to start picking that up, that cost, I mean, and Anne, you kind of said that the monumental number, you know, in our daughterhood circle, uh, about a Zoom meeting that we had what, a month or two ago, yeah. it's astronomical. <laughs> it is an astronomical number. And so um, trillions, and it doesn't even, and that, that just covers for, I think, um, Anne, you mentioned that only covers for the folks that are like in on Medicaid and in poverty. That doesn't cover like the middle class, right? Yeah, and have, a, have, a, tr have a trillion dollars. So Biden proposed half a trillion dollars over 10 years to increase funding for home and community-based services, like in-home services and support. And so we pay some of those uh, daughters. You know, one of my friends went and got, um, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a silly metaphor. You know, we went volunteering at Kitchens for Good. We had to go get a food handler's card and take a food handler's course to get a little certificate so that we could go do this. She took a, a course that got her a caregiver's card so she's allowed to go into the facility during COVID and help with and see her dad and oh. see her mom. her mom died because she took this Smart. course and she got, you know, whatever I dotted and T crossed so she yeah. can continue to see her parents. Wow. That's another resource to let people know about, do you want to be able to take this little course and what, and, or do you want to do this particular whatever and get assigned as the person who gets that pay 
from the government so that when you've given up your job to help your mom, you still can get paid? I mean, what about those little other ways? Yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, so this is, it's funny you should say that because, uh, you know, part of the, so part of the challenge from a federal policy perspective is that every single state, you know, and Charlie will know this, but every single state has their own way of doing Medicaid. And I, Christine probably knows this too. And so, so when, when a, a well-meaning policymaker like Vice President Biden says, I want, I really want to do, I really want to be able to increase the dollars available through these public programs to help people. The problem is that like the little experts like me who are involved in that are like, so in California, they've set it up so that family members can get paid for caregiving in part because there's a workforce crisis. It's hard to get workers. So, you know, do we, like there's a thousand flowers blooming out there. Do we just want to give more money to California to do more of what they're doing? Or do we want to create a national policy that in some ways, like, would just... Well, everybody just came, so it doesn't seem to be like a state's issue. Yeah. I mean, yeah. end of life is a global issue. Right. But if we, if we yeah. say you get to have, we're going to create a federal program, you get to have, like, you, at some point, when you do something the big, you have to make these arbitrary decisions about sort of what it is that you're paying for. And that invariably creates an enormous amount of inflexibility so that it feels like this one size fits all. Uh, the nice thing about how states and local governments doing things and providers doing things is that they can actually get a sense of individual situations and needs and matching and whatever. So from a federal perspective, it's like, maybe we should just give the money to a county or to a state, stipulate what it is for and let them design the innovative programs, you know, that it's hard, I will just tell you, it is hard to design policy in a way that you feel comfortable is actually going to be effective because, you know, you, you're, you have to make a decision at some point, you know what I, so like, you know, like hospice is a good example. So hospice, you can only get hospice when you are, you have to give up all curative care to get hospice. A lot of people are really uncomfortable with that, but they really do need to be moved into the palliative, you know, kind of stream. And so, but Medicare doesn't pay for palliative care. So it's very, it's an awkward. Medicare so, okay, doesn't pay for you know, health either until COVID happens. So maybe that's what we have to do is um, lobby Medicare to expand their repertoire for palliative. Yeah, that they, would be. They just recently changed in telehealth and Lots of changes are happening, so yep. maybe lobby effort. There are definitely some changes on the horizon, but not as fast or as much as I would like. So I see that we're starting to lose people. <laughs> so I just wanted to, um, Deborah has a question, so I just wanted her to be able to ask, um, if she doesn't have a video on, so she just asked me if I could, she could raise her hand. So. Deborah, consider your hand raised and please ask your question. Thank you. It was actually more um, questions, comments. Um, when you were asking, did we want something on a nationwide basis? What kind of program would that look like? I mean, I get the tension between a, a nationwide standard versus a more localized. And my gut reaction when you proposed it is what about a nationwide standard as a floor? and that states are able to provide something that goes above and beyond what the federal standard would be. No, I love that. I love that. I, I think that's exactly right. Like, um, to, so because we want to preserve flexibility. Right. Right. If a state wants to pay family members, 
Uh, like we see, you know, at a minimum, everybody's entitled to, you know, you know, a, a home care benefit that includes X number of hours or, you know, the, we're going to, it's like, you know, we're going to, there's going to be a sort of a subsidy for some certain amount of services and care management and care coordination and geriatric care, you know, we're going to kind of create these hubs. I mean, I have this vision that we would actually use federal dollars to create, to, we have area agencies on aging that we have a whole thing that we, they get no money, like no money. Like that's crazy. Why can't we take the area agencies on aging really, really, I mean, really fund them and allow them to be these hubs of service delivery and support to help connect everybody to services in their market. And then if we provide a little bit more financing to go towards the actual services that people need like home care, at a reasonable rate to the agency so they can pay the workers what they need to get paid, you know, then, then we can, then we, ha then we have a system, <laughs> then we have an actual system. Mm -hmm. So, but Deborah, to your point, like, you know, we set that standard is like, it has to look like this, but you can, if you want, there's flexibility to do these other things. And right. I love, I really like that as a, as a model. So then two other observations. One, if we're going to continue to use going forward in our policy making Medicaid as part of the solution, my understanding is that the asset threshold for Medicaid has not been raised in God knows how long. I think, I want to say decades. I mean, I heard oh, a, yeah. story, a story on it. So if we're going to keep using Medicaid, that asset threshold should be raised to something that's more realistic. And then I, going a completely different direction. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this word. I'm sure somebody here does. But, and I only know if you could see me, I'm holding up my finger, my thumb and my index finger going this much. I only know this much about it. But my understanding is in the Netherlands, they have something called Dementia Village. Yeah. Where instead of warehousing people, they've got an entire village built out that, um, is a, a caregiving ecosystem for people with dementia. Yep. And I'd love, I mean, I, I don't, when I heard it, it sounded wonderful. I haven't had a chance to really research it and see whether the reality is as wonderful as the vision appears to be. But assuming it is, God, I'd love to see something like that go on here rather than say we need to get money for long term care in a nursing home when somebody has dementia, I'd rather we form some sort of village for them where they get to have more freedom and, um, you know, independence in a safe environment. I love, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll spell the name of the village for those who don't know it, or I could put it in the chat. It's H-O-G-E-W-E-Y. I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'm now going to Type it <laughs> Thank chat. you. Thank I didn't you. want to insult anyone by destroying that name, but it is. I don't think you are at any risk of that. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, I didn't type. Oops, I'm trying. There are a to lot of vowels in that word. Yeah. So, so listen daughterhood members, it is almost 11 o'clock for Anne and Roseanne and the other folks and, and Charlie that are on the East, that are on East Coast time. So I, I want to, they're probably dying to go to bed and I want to be able to respect that. So I know we were supposed to end at 730, but I mean, obviously this conversation is wonderful. This is the type of conversations that need to be had. Um, and we're so grateful for, for bringing it up. We're grateful to you for daughterhood and bringing yeah. this to, bringing this to us. And um, I don't know, it's, it's been a wonderful and it's been a magical five years. Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. so thank you for me. Thank you so much for remarking it. It was, it's meant a lot. It's meant, it's meant an enormous amount to me to, to just have the opportunity to take a step back today, especially in the last week, just thinking about it all preparing for tonight and like what has it all meant what it's been a great it's been a great exercise for me and I just want to invite everybody on the call um, 
you know, I'll put my, please reach out to me personally if you, you know, um, hold on, send chat to everyone. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you my uh, work email because that's the one I check all the time. Um, Cause I know Charlie and a couple other people, I think had a few more things to say and I'm always, I'm, my ears are open and I'm interested in staying connected to all of you and, and continuing to just be the recipient of all of these really good ideas and input. And, um, and I really like, I really will take this back to people who I think have a lot of influence and in hopefully what I personally, because of my politics hope will be a new administration next year. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> so, but he will have a lot to do. It's gonna be tough. So we have to be patient. <laughs> so yeah. it, no, this is this is a big road. There's no, there's no open yeah. here. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. to fix. There's a just lot. Small changes fix. though, any, just small change. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there oh, there you go, like, there you go. But uh, the, thank you all so much. So please stay in touch with me and, um, and I will, you know, with you as well. And, and Karen and Christine, congratulations. This was, this was great. Um, Caregivers are unstoppable. Yes, and thank you so much to Elizabeth. And that was an incredible presentation. Yes, and Jan, thank you for sharing. Jan, oh my gosh, Jan. Yeah, Jan is another one, you know, just just like Pam yesterday. Jan is another one that's been there since the very beginning. So she's a she's a daughterhood veteran warrior, and we're so thankful for her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, we now we have the back, everybody, and you have the movement. We're here. You <laughs> have the movement. Five years ago, you did not. You now that's have. That's great. It. Yes. So there we go. Here we are. We're ready. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We love you all. You all are so magnificent. Thank you. I'm so grateful right back at for you. all of you joining us. There will be more of this. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Bye lovelies. I can't do that. I can never do it. <laughs> it looks like it looks like I don't know what it looks like, but I love you. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you guys Good night. so much. We're so grateful. Good night, everybody. You the Thank you guys you. are the best. You guys are the best. We love you, Roseanne. Yes, we do, Roseanne. Another love you night. too. Love you guys too. Very Another much. late night. Take care. Thank you. Bye. You should be very, I don't have to tell you, you should be proud of yourself. You I'm should be proud sorry, of yourself. I'm, starting, I'm tearing up right now. A great night. Great double night. Great job, you guys. Great job. You're making people, you're making a difference. And you should so know. So are that. you, sister. So are you. You guys were the first. Thank you. Take care. Mm -hmm.